I'm Dr. Jean van Leeuwen, Chair of the SADA Scientific Advisory Committee. We'd like to invite you to the SADA National Conference to be held in Cape Town from the 25th to the 27th of August. Streamlined over the three full days, this year's program features more podium speakers, more lecture time, and more trader interaction. See you in Cape Town this August. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. And I hope you enjoy that little short video about the Congress and I hope to see everyone there. <laughs> On behalf of the South African Association of Pediatric Dentistry, I take great pleasure this evening in welcoming you all to our webinar. And thanks to Nadine Muller, who will be presenting to us this evening. Um, my name is Ravina Naidu, and I am the KZM Branch Manager of the SAPD. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Nadine Mulek. Nadine qualified as a dentist in 2000. After community service, she joined private practice where she discovered that her passion lies with pediatric patients. She joined a pediatric practice in 2007 where she could dive into the work that she loves. She obtained her postgraduate diploma in pediatric dentistry in 2016 and obtained her master's degree in pediatric dentistry in 2019 at UP. She is now based at the University of Pretoria as a stomatologist and coordinator of the pediatric division within the Department of Odontology. She is passionate about teaching and developing student skills and about changing the lives of pediatric patients. In her free time, she loves to spend time with friends and family, and she's a foodie, loves her food, <laughs> and loves to travel. Speaking of travel, she recently attended the International Association of Pediatric Dentistry Congress um, in the Netherlands in June. So hopefully, Nadine, we'll hear a little snippets about that and uh, make us all excited to maybe attend a congress in pediatric dentistry soon. <laughs> Over to you, Nadine. Thank you very much. Can you see me and can you hear me? Thank you. Um, yes, it was a fantastic experience, I must say, the um, IAPD conference in the Netherlands. And um, just to share uh, your thoughts and ideas with like-minded people and to know that there are other child-loving people out there, it was a wonderful experience. And I'm very excited about the IAPD conference that will happen in South Africa in 2025. So um, I hope that you will all be joining us there. But without further ado, thank you very much, Dr. Naidu, for the kind introduction. It's indeed a privilege to be here tonight and to share my thoughts on pulp treatment on primary pulpotomy uh, or primary tooth um, uh, treatment. And I will share my screen now um, in order to start with the presentation. Um, I would just like to move this slightly. Sorry, here we go. Um, Okay, so as you know, the um, movement is now towards minimally invasive dentistry, and um, we are all um, focused on um, caries prevention and caries treatment rather than um, invasive surgical treatments. And that is what today's uh, presentation is going to be about. I want to go back to basics so that we can actually think about what it is that we are doing, why we are doing it, and um, how we are going to achieve the best possible results. Everything should be based on um, on, on sound research and on evidence-based dentistry. I want to encourage you to think of each and every patient as if it's your own child, or at least your sister's child or your best friend's child, and treat that patient with the best possible outcome in mind. <clears throat> Thank you. 
the aim of bulb therapy in the primary dentition is ultimately for us to preserve the uh, primary tooth until it's time for natural exfoliation, because there is no other space maintainer such as the primary teeth itself, and we want to maintain the integrity of the arch. I can't emphasize the importance of making the correct diagnosis. The correct diagnosis is the key to your treatment plan. And if you choose the correct treatment pathway, you will ultimately reach your goal of uh, the best long-term prognosis for your treatment. Take time to do a proper diagnosis. You, you um, must take a proper medical and dental history and focus on the pain history, because this will give you very important clues on the final diagnosis of the tooth. Ask about the location of the pain, the intensity of the pain. Is the pain spontaneous or is it only brought upon um, by a stimulus? If it is by a stimulate, stimulus, what is the aggravating or, um, aspects or what brings pain relief? And then once you have that background history, it's important to take a radiograph and to take a proper radiograph where you can see the crown as well as the apices. You want to see the vacation area and the adjacent bone to make sure that you're not overlooking any pathology. You also need to see the size of the curious lesion and whether there is pulpal involvement. Finally, once you have started with your procedure, you will have confirmation of your diagnosis once you've opened the bulb chamber and you look at the blood if there is bleeding. If there is no bleeding, then of course it's a non-vital tooth, but if there is bright red bleeding, you know you're dealing with a vital tooth, probably a healthy pulp or reversible pulpitis, or when there is profuse bleeding or dark red blood or scanty bleeding, then you're most probably dealing with a vital tooth with irreversible pulpitis. So that will also guide you in your treatment plan. So once you have made a proper diagnosis, you can follow the, the um, care pathway and know if you are dealing with a vital tooth, um, you will most probably do an in, indirect pulp treatment, direct pulp capping or a pulpotomy. And if you are dealing with a non-vital tooth or a tooth with irreversible pulpitis, you will do either a pulpectomy or lesion sterilization tissue repair. In the case of a vital tooth, your um, diagnosis will lead you um, that there will be no pain or the tooth will be asymptomatic. It might be a small curious lesion. Um, and in that case, you will be dealing with a vital tooth with a healthy pulp. In this case, um, you might experience that uh, the tooth might have, um, or the pulp might have been exposed due to trauma, or when you were doing a very um, conservative restoration, you might have iatrogenically exposed the pulp. And um, for that, we would do in, uh, uh, indirect pulp therapy or direct pulp capping. In the case where we have reversible pulpitis, in other words, where there's a curious lesion um, causing pain on stimuli, where the pain is only for, there for a short duration and not lingering and not spontaneous, and the curious is close or into the pulp, then you would do a pulpotomy and not one of the other treatment options. A vital tooth with irreversible pulpitis will typically have spontaneous pain and the pain will last for long after the stimulus was removed. And um, once you open the pulp chamber, as I said earlier, the color of the pulpal bleeding will also lead you to know that you are dealing with pulpitis, irreversible pulpitis. And in that case, your treatment option should be a pulpectomy. A non-vital treatment tooth can um, typically present with a sinus tract, with soft tissue pathology or gingival swelling related to the tooth, not to any other periodontal disease. The tooth might also appear to be excessively mobile and not associated with exfoliation time, of course. And the radiographic signs will also tell you if you're dealing with a non-vital tooth, you will most likely see um, a radiolucency in the furcation area because that is, of course, where all the, the accessory canals in a primary tooth is. And um, you might even also see internal or external root resorption. Whenever there is pus, in other words, where there is swelling or a sinus tract formation or a vacation lesion, that is indicative of a tooth being non-vital. The non-vital tooth can then be treated either by means of a pulpectomy or with lesion sterilization tissue repair. 
So a vital tooth treatment, as we said, can then either be indirect pulp therapy, direct pulp capping, or a pulpotomy. Indirect pulp therapy is typically done when you have a tooth, um, a healthy vital tooth, with a carious lesion, that if you were to remove all of the caries, you would expose the pulp. This tooth would not have been symptomatic. It would have been an asymptomatic tooth. In this case, you would try to remove all of the infected um, soft dentine, but you want to leave a firm caries affected dentine only over the pulpal floor. And your aim would be here to enhance um, pulpal healing. So the materials that you would typically use for indirect pulp therapy would be either a glass ionomer, resin-modified glass ionomer, calcium hydroxide, zinc oxide eugenol, or MTA. You want to make sure that you have at least two millimeters of um, dentine overlying the pulp and then place your material. The material can then be covered with the restoration of your choice. And very important, and I'm going to repeat this very often, is to ensure that you have a proper seal of your final restoration. As you know all too well, the pulp chain of a primary tooth is much larger than in a permanent tooth, and those pulp wounds seem to be everywhere. So when you think you are doing a very conservative, small little cavity preparation, you often end up nicking the pulp. Uh, if you end up with iatrogenic pulpal exposure, where there was no caries involved, then you might do a direct pulp capping, but only if that pulp exposure was due to trauma or iatrogenic exposure, not when there was caries exposure. You would typically then clean your cavity with sodium hypochlorite and then um, use a moist cotton pellet to clean the rest of the cavity, followed by a layer of MTA, around about 1.5 millimeters, and then cover the tooth with the restoration as you always would have. Um, the International Association of Pediatric Dentistry reached consensus that we don't use calcium hydroxide in um, pulp therapy and primary teeth anymore. In this instance where you see this photo, the um, practitioner made a mistake. The, um, the pulp was exposed and there was caries exposure, but the practitioner did a direct pulp capping or pulp treatment of some sort, and this ended up and resulted in that, uh, um, you can see that furcation lesion there, and the patient had pain and trauma. If the diagnosis is correct, what you want to see after a while is that dentinal bridge formation, as you can see on that x-ray photo. This is just another example of where the diagnosis was wrong. So where there's carious exposure, you cannot do direct pulp capping. In this case, the operator also decided to do direct pulp capping, and that result was very unfavorable for the patient, ended up in um, trauma and um, discomfort. So there is not enough evidence in the literature um, to recommend partial pulpotomies for primary teeth, although this is done in the permanent dentition. So if you have pulpal involvement and indirect pulp treatment or direct pulp capping is not indicated, then you will opt to do a pulpotomy. A pulpotomy is typically um, where there is a, a vital tooth that is asymptomatic, where you've had uh, quite a bit of iatrogenic um, exposure or um, traumatic exposure, or where you have a reversible pulpitis with the typical diagnostic signs as we talked about earlier on. The lesion will either be in very close proximity to the pulp or it might even go into the pulp. Um, when you do a pulpotomy, you have to think about what it is that you want to achieve and which materials we will um, use to get the best results. So as I said earlier on, I want to go back to basics. So think about what we want the ideal pulpotomy material to do. It should be antibacterial. It should be biocompatible. We want it to be able to induce hard tissue formation and we don't want it to affect our physiological root resorption. And of course, we also want it to be affordable. 
there are so many materials to choose from and it's very difficult to choose the correct material and to actually know what to choose. So, uh, so the, some of the materials are good fixing agents such as former Cressel. Others are um, you know, static agents like ferric sulfate and then we have the antibacterial agents like sodium hypochloride. Others contain corticosteroids and antibiotics such as Sledamix. And then of course we have our zinc oxide eugenol which has the historical value of eugenol as the desensitizer for a painful pulp. We are also now moving to non-pharmacotherapeutic approaches such as laser treatments. But still, how do we decide? So um, I'm going to just look at the history of the development of materials to give us a little bit of guidance. So former Cressel is still up to today used as the gold standard in pulpotomy materials because of its good clinical performance. Now, this was first introduced to the industry in 1902 by Buckley, and the initial formula contained 19% formaldehyde, 35% cresol, 15% glycerin in distilled water. It was quite a, a strong um, concentration. So because of the fixative qualities and the fact that they that they knew it was that they knew it was um, bactericidal, and the um, uh, in, the enzymes were um, inhibited, and they used this as a material. The um, the um, original composition of former Cressel was very strong, and originally they would open the pulp chamber, they would place former Cressel in there and leave it there for quite some time. And this led to total necrosis of the pulp. Um, uh, originally, um, then they would look at it histolo histologically and they would say that it um, is cytotoxic because of the inflammation that led to necrosis and then obviously then to internal resorption. But later studies were done and then they diluted this original formula to a fifth of its original strength and they would use it only for one minute on that pulp and that gave much better clinical results. So that led to a superficial layer of fixation and um, uh, still remaining uh, the vitality of the, uh, the radicular pulp would then remain. So up until today, the AAPD as well as the IAPD endorse former Gressel because of the high success rate and the affordability of this material. Now, glutaraldehyde is not used in dentistry or in South Africa for this purpose anymore, but just as a matter of completeness, I'm just going to include that as well. So the potential um, toxicity of glutaraldehyde was lower as compared to former Cressel. It's also a fixative material. And um, when they did some experiments with this, they found that it also caused internal resorption. And there was also uh, an amount of cytotoxicity. So they couldn't justify this as an alternative material to former Cressel. Calcium hydroxide, we know very well. We've been using it since the 1930s in dentistry, and it's, it was a very favorable material because of the ability um, to form reparative dentine and to enhance pulp healing. But unfortunately, there's a low success rate with calcium hydroxide, and this is due to the physical properties of this material. This material is a non-setting material. It undergoes degradation and dissolution, and because of that, an infection will form and internal resorption is quite often a result when we use calcium hydroxide. Now, unfortunately, calcium hydroxide has a low clinical success rate and is not favored for pulp treatment in primary dead teeth at all. Sodium hypochlorite is an antibacterial material um, that causes minimal inflammation. When we use it, we normally use a three to 5% concentration Moist, uh, the, use it to moisten the cotton pellet, apply it to the pulp for 30 to 60 seconds, and um, there's a very good success rate comparable to ferric sulfate and former Cressel at 12 months. However, when compared to former, uh, former Cressel and ferric sulfate at a 24-month uh, period, the success rate was lower. So, so although sodium chloride can be used, um, because there are current better alternatives with better clinical and radiographic success over a long term. 
and then zinc oxide eugenol. We all know this material, it's the most frequently used one for the sedative effects on the pulp, but unfortunately eugenol causes a chronic inflammatory um, response on the pulp. And because of that, the clinical success rate for zinc oxide eugenol is lower than that of the other available pulpotinum materials. But even so, it is still um, widely used and very popular. Ferric sulfate is a hemostatic agent, and it is um, very good at that. It gives quick hemostasis. The reported failures are due to a result of internal resorption. And when you use ferric sulfate, the clinical success is comparable to ferric uh, to former cresol. And um, the good thing about this is that there are fewer concerns about the toxicity. Now, laser treatment, as I've mentioned, is um, now a, a new or was gaining field in dentistry. And the most commonly used laser for this purpose would be the diode laser. The nice thing about the laser is that it can bypass the toxicity that we get um, with our dental materials. It also gives bleeding control and it also helps with sterilization of the wound. So um, in some of the studies that were done, there were comparable clinical and radiographic results which proved to be promising. But the studies so far are small studies and there are um, limited follow-up studies done. So for now, um, more research is required before we can really endorse and say a laser is a very good option. It is a good option, but um, not the best yet. MTA or biodentine, that is uh, our flagship at the moment um, because the main components induce the formation of dentine, cementum and bone. And what happens when you use MTA or um, biodentine is the calcium components um, act with a humid environment and then it creates calcium hydroxide. And with this calcium hydroxide that is created, the uh, um, pH level rises to 12.5 and that of course is inhospitable for bacteria. So it's a, it causes um, an antibacterial field and it also sets very well. So we get a very good seal when we use this material. It's um, very um, good at forming a dental bridge because of that calcium hydroxide that forms and there's less inflammation and necrosis than with calcium hydroxide in any of the other regenerative um, materials. So yes, it's a very, very good material. It's the superior material to use at this stage because of the biocompatibility, the good seal, the fact that it's antimicrobial and that it sits in the presence of moisture. But um, everything is not perfect. Uh, well, we can't be that lucky. So unfortunately, because of the um, difficulty in handling um, and the discoloration of the tooth, the fact that it has a low radio opacity and that it's incompatible with other materials at some times and also very expensive, just um, doesn't count in MTA's favor. There are, uh, for interest stake, uh, many studies done on MTA and biodentine. And this study, for one, uh, they did follow up um, uh, um, treatments or follow up um, visits with the patients which were treated with MTA and biodentine at 6, 12, 18, and 24 months. And the success rate for biodentine and MTA um, was 99% and 97%, which just um, shows that it is really a superior material to use. Let's just go back to how we do the pulpotomy to the procedure. Otomy means to cut out or to remove. So um, a pulpotomy then refers to the removal of the infected or the affected coronal pulp, leaving behind healthy radicular pulp. And um, we want to leave the healthy radicular pulp, which is capable of healing itself. And um, the pulpotomy procedure is typically done on uh, where the, the diagnosis is a curiously exposed tooth with a healthy pulp, or where there was reversible pulpitis with no periapical involvement. You would um, first um, give your patient local anesthesia and then ensure that you have proper isolation with rubber dime ideally. Remove all of the curious tissue before you expose the pulp. And once you expose the pulp, you can then switch to a endo -Z 
Now the endo burr has a blunt tip and that will help you to prevent perforation of the pulp or floor. The endo burr can then be used to remove the, the roof of the pulp chamber completely and to ensure that you have straight line access. And once you've entered the pulp chamber, the color of the blood will again confirm your diagnosis. What you want to see when you do a pulpotomy is this bright red healthy bleeding. It's now time to amputate the pulp, and you can do that by using an excavator or a sterile round Gary's burr. Make sure that if you choose to use the burr, that you are very careful not to perforate the floor of the pulp chamber. You can also now use the excavator to check for straight line access. Make sure you don't have any overhangs or any ledges where um, pulp tissue can be entrapped. So once you've opened the pulp chamber, you've amputated the pulp, you can now obtain hemostasis. So first you would use a moist cotton pellet with sterile water and apply pressure on those pulpal stumps. And then you can use your materials. You can use either ferric sulfate, sodium hypochlorite, or formocresol to achieve hemostasis and to form that barrier. Once you have hemostasis, you are going to place a dressing. And again, you can choose to, uh, well, many um, practitioners use zinc oxide eugenol, biodentine, MTA, or calcium hydroxide, but we know now that calcium hydroxide is not a suitable material. So ideally MTA, and if you don't have that to your, um, in your practice, you can use the zinc oxide eugenol for this purpose. Make sure that you place the material in the pulp chamber only so that it doesn't affect the um, final restoration seal. And the final restoration should seal properly, as I said earlier on, that is going to affect the final outcome, the, um, the, the, uh, the success of your procedure. So you have to ensure that you have a good seal. First prize would be stainless steel crown, but I know that everybody, uh, they don't, don't have access to stainless steel crowns in the practices. So if you don't have a stainless steel crown, just make sure that the restoration that you place seal very well and that you do regular follow-ups to make sure that the restoration is still in place. So in summary, when it comes to a pulpotomy, the diagnosis is the most important thing. And then the best materials to use for a tooth that has to be retained for longer than 24 months, formacrystal and MTA. The other materials can also be used conditionally. We shouldn't use calcium hydroxide anymore. And then, of course, we have to place a good permanent restoration that seals properly. Now, when we have a tooth that is vital with irreversible pompitis or a non-vital tooth, we will either do a pulpectomy, lesion sterilization, tissue repair, or an extraction in some unfortunate cases. A pulpectomy is done where we remove the total pulpal contents because ectomy means to remove or to cut out. So we remove the coronal as well as the radicular pulp and then we want to create a sterile environment which we can seal with the resorbable material. We do a pulpectomy in case of where we have the diagnosis of irreversible pulpitis or necrotic pulp and it's, um, it doesn't matter whether the periapical status is acute or chronic. So the procedure again is very much like that of a pulpotomy, good local anesthesia, isolation, especially in this case, we need to use rubber dam. And then we remove the caries, open the pulp chamber again, using an endo set, ensuring good straight line access, and then identify the orifices. You can now enlarge the orifice with a gates glid in number two or number three. And then it's time to do length determination. Now, if you've chosen to do a pulpectomy, you would have a preoperative radiograph with um, the full length of the tooth, which will guide you in this. Now, ideally, also, you would use an apex locator. The reason I'm saying this is if you look at that photo on the right hand side, the um, the resorption of the primary roots can be treacherous. And if you were to take an x-ray photo of that tooth there, it would look as if you were on length perfectly. But um, if you were to fill that canal or obturate that canal, you would find that the material would, uh, you would extrude the material there and that would have negative results sometimes. So ideally use an apex locator 
And regardless whether you use an apex locator or um, a radiographic uh, length determination, always work two millimeters short of your apex that you've determined to play it safe. So the technique that you use to prepare the canal, there are very uh, different techniques and different systems. And they actually found that it doesn't really matter which technique you use. If you use hand instrumentation, whether you use rotary instrumentation, success rate is very much the same. So this is up to you as a practitioner. If you choose to do hand instrumentation, of course, you would have rubber dam in place. You would have um, measured the, or the apex or located the apex and worked two millimeters short of that. And then you would start with the smallest possible file that you can get in there. You may use RC prep to help you um, and you're going to prepare up into a number 25 to a number 35 depending on the size of the root that you're working with in between uh, if you choose to do rotary instrumentation and um, this is the one that I choose I prefer rotary instrumentation because it saves you a little bit of time and you get a very good um, shaping of the canal there are various um, techniques described in the literature. Some people like to use a keto file, some use um, other files and other systems. Um, my personal preference is to use an SX file because of the shape of the file. It's normally used um, in endodontics to, to shape the coronal part of the crown or for a very short tooth. So it's ideal, the shape is ideal for um, primary teeth shaping. You would then um, prepare your tooth with hand instrumentation up into a number 20 file and then switch over to the rotary system. The um, SX file would then be um, placed, uh, it would be placed to the uh, working length and then you would, in a brushing motion, just move upwards and outwards and you would repeat this motion three times. And there you go, preparation is done. In between filing and afterwards, you have to irrigate. You can use either chlorhexidine, sodium hypochloride, or sterile water. So what does the literature say? Um, which material should you rather use? Now, the recent systematic reviews state that there's no uh, statistically um, significant difference in the success. So you can choose whichever one you want. Sodium hypochlorite, though, is a potent tissue irritant. And um, when we think of the open or the resorbing apex of the primary tooth, I uh, would rather not use that because if it extrudes beyond the apex, you will have a sodium hypochlorite incident, which would not be comfortable. So I would much rather use chlorhexidine. That's my personal favorite. And then after irrigation, dry the canals using paper tips that you have measured. Never place anything into a, a root canal that you have not measured. Now it's time to obturate. And again, there are so many different materials to choose from. But in the literature, um, it is described again that what do we want in a perfect obturation material? We know it must be a resorbable material. We know it mustn't irritate the tissues. We know it must be disinfectant. Um, the excess must be resorbed easily by the, uh, the body. It must be easy to handle. It should adhere to the walls. And we want it to not discolor the tooth. We want to see it on an x-ray photo. It must induce a proper seal and it shouldn't harm the permanent successor. So that's a mouthful. Uh, the systemic reviews and the meta-analysis and also the IAPD consensus all um, put together you can use either one of these materials. So um, the endoflas, which is a combination of zinc oxide, uniform, and um, calcium hydroxide. To my knowledge, it's not available in South Africa, but I've just put it in here for um, uh, to take note of. Um, you can also use non-reinforced zinc oxide eugenol or the combination paste, which is a combination of uniform and calcium hydroxide. We know that as Vitapex or a metapex. Again, the, the procedure to follow depends on what material you choose. So if you choose to use zinc oxide eugenol, you're going to mix it to a ra rather firm consistency or thick, and you are going to um, place it into the canal using a plastic instrument, or you can use a lentulo filler. You can then use um, 
um, the, the pluggers, dental K files, or the lentula filler to obturate the canal, and then finish off by um, applying pressure with a moist cotton pellet on the coronal aspect. If you choose to use Vitapex or Metapex, it's comfortably um, packaged in a syringe with a disposable tip. Again, measure the tip. Um, you put the tip to working length and then you apply light pressure. And as you extrude the material, you are gonna pull out the syringe while still depositing material. And once you've um, completely um, removed the syringe, you are also going to condense the material with a moist cotton pellet. Now it's time to fill the tooth. And again, the restoration is a very important determinant of the outcome of your procedure. Ideally, stainless steel crown. So you would build the crown up with zinc oxide eugenol or glass ionomer and place a stainless steel crown over that. And if you don't have a stainless steel crown, it is acceptable to restore the tooth with glass ionomer. And um, something that um, is gaining popularity is lesion sterilization tissue repair. That is where um, the root canal is disinfected with an antibiotic mixture and more likely than not without instrumentation. Some people prefer to use instrumentation and then also apply the antibiotics, but you don't have to use instruments. You don't have to use files in the canals. The most commonly for this purpose, a combination of ciprofloxacin, metronidazole and clindamine, clindamycin is used. Um, please note not to use tetracycline as that might cause discoloration of the permanent successor. Uh, the preparation of this mixture, it's um, described in the literature in very various different ways. So I have just condensed all that information to make it a little bit easier here. Um, it's available as triple antibiotic paste, or you can ask your pharmacist to, to prepare this for you. So ask them to remove the film layer of the tablets and then pulverize the tablets using a mortar and a pestle. Um, and then uh, you can um, keep this in an airtight container out of light away from moisture. When it's time to use it, you are gonna mix it in equal quantities and you can mix it with propylene glycol and um, that is also available from the pharmacist, or you can use sterile local, uh, local anesthesia. So you're going to um, mix that to form a paste or an ointment. How to do this? Of course, you do this only on a non-vital tooth. So you would open the tooth as you always would for pulp treatment. You can then enlarge the orifices using a round burr and then rinse this, the cavity and clean the cavity with phosphoric acid rinse it with sterile water and dry the cavity, and then apply the antibiotic mixture in that bulb chamber using a micro brush. It's then covered with zinc oxide eugenol or MTA, and then restored as you would have restored uh, any other tooth. So uh, the question is, when do you do a pulpectomy and when do you do lesion sterilization tissue repair? It all depends on the stage of root resorption. If a tooth um, had no root resorption preoperatively, then you would opt for a pulpectomy as the outcome is much better. But in case of um, a fair amount of root resorption, you could rather opt for LSTR. So in short, LSTR could be applied when a tooth does not have to be retained for longer than 12 months. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to um, opt for the extraction route when there's inadequate crown or when there's extensive structure resorption and the tooth is not resorbable. So that's in a nutshell, bulb therapy. Once you have the diagnosis, you've determined whether a tooth is vital or non-vital, whether it's healthy or whether it has bulbitis, you know which care pathway to follow and which will hopefully lead you to the best possible outcome. Now, as um, pediatric dentists, we are very often confronted with immature permanent teeth that presents with traumatic injuries or um, with large carious lesions, especially on the first permanent molars. Uh, um, these young teeth have very wide bulb chambers um, with loose connective tissue, rich in blood, vessels and cells. And this is to our advantage because um, because of this, the pulp tissue has a very good healing ability. 
And um, our aim is ultimately to maintain the vitality of the tooth so that we can keep that tooth in the mouth. Uh, it's a good idea to just familiarize yourself with the permanent tooth um, eruption times and of course the time of root completion because we are confronted with this very often as you can see especially the central teeth where trauma is involved and those first permanent molars where we have deep carious lesions so our aim ultimately again is to promote conditions when we do a root canal treatment on these immature uh, permanent teeth we want to aid healing we want to preserve the vitality and we want that root to develop continuously again as with primary teeth the history and the diagnosis is the key to successful treatments Apexogenesis refers to the procedures that we do on vital teeth, vital immature teeth, where we want to manage it to ensure continued physiological development of the root apex. And we can um, achieve that by either doing an indirect pulp capping, a direct pulp capping, a sick repulsive, partial pulpotomy, or a pulpotomy. So when we do an indirect pulp capping, that would be where the uh, lesion is close to the pulp or the, and there's no exposure or where there's very deep caries. And if you were to remove all the caries, you would end up exposing the pulp. An indirect pulp capping can only be done on a vital healthy pulp or where there is reversible pulpitis. So as I explained with the primary teeth, you would remove all of the soft dentine, all of the infected dentine, and leave affected dentine with a portion of the dentine um, overlying the pulp. You would then place a protective liner. And um, like we said earlier on, calcium hydroxide is not um, commonly used anymore. Um, you would rather use zinc oxide eugenol or um, a bonding agent or um, MTA. It's very important when you've done indirect bulb capping to follow your patient up at regular intervals to make sure that there is no pain, no swelling, and no pathology. In other words, make sure that you had the correct diagnosis. Direct pulp capping is again done where the, the pulp is exposed as with um, the primary dentition, not with curious exposure, but uh, just with iatrogenic damage or traumatic um, small exposure. That pulp will be capped with MTA and then sealed with a good restoration. And then partial pulpotomies and these immature uh, permanent teeth. A partial pulpotomy due to curious exposure or a partial pulpotomy due to traumatic exposure, also known as a sphic pulpotomy, is based on the same principle more or less. So you are dealing with a vital tooth with an exposed pulp and you want to make sure of your diagnosis here. We, we don't want a tooth that is irreversibly infected or an, a necrotic tooth. So you have to take very good history. You have to find out how long, um, if uh, in the case of a traumatic injury, how long has that pulp been exposed? Um, make sure that you are dealing with the vital pulp. So the um, procedure I will explain to you in a little while, but your ultimate goal is to get healthy vital pulp tissue into contact with your medicament, which is going to be MTA, because we want to promote pulp healing. Um, the procedure then entails that you give good local anesthesia, of course, very good um, isolation by using rubber dam, and then preparing your access cavity. You will then amputate the, um, up the top layer of that bulb, um, and depending on the um, caries uh, lesion or the time that the pulp was exposed after trauma, you will um, amputate enough pulpal tissue to reach vital healthy pulp with red bleeding. You must be able to control the bleeding quite easily and you are going to use sodium hypochlorite for this and not chlorhexidine as chlorhexidine is, um, uh, has a negative influence and is toxic to the progenitor cells. So sodium hypochlorite would be used here to obtain hemostasis um, 
and then you would place at least four millimeters of MTA to cover that healthy pulpal tissue. The MTA will be covered with resin modified gloss honomer, and then you will build the tooth up with restoration material. It's important to follow this tooth up regularly. And um, what is it that you're going to check for? You are going to look and see if you have dentinal bridge formation. You want to see that the root, root is actually growing. You want to see root lengthening, root thickening, and apex closure in the end. This procedure then, uh, just uh, again, is done on a vital tooth where you want to promote closure of the root and um, root formation. So the um, material is used on the coronal bolt of the bulb. It's contraindicated to do an apexogenesis procedure on a tooth that has spontaneous pain, where there is radiolucency, where there is excessive hemorrhage, which you can't control, where there's a purulent exudate or pulp calcification, and also where there is internal resorption. In these cases, you would most probably opt for a pulpectomy procedure with apexification. So apexification is typically done on an immature permanent tooth, which is non-vital. And your aim here is to induce a artificial barrier so that you can complete a root canal treatment there. <clears throat> the technique, again, you are going to give good local anesthesia, isolate the tooth, and remove all the radicular tissue. But you are going to work two millimeters short of the apex at first, disinfect the canal, and then place calcium hydroxide in that tooth for one to two weeks only. The reason you do this is just to stabilize the pH inside that canal. You're then going to irrigate the canal when you open it up again, and then your aim would be to shape that canal and specifically that apical area so that you are able to place three to four millimeters of MTA to form that apical seal. Once you've managed that, um, and you will ideally have to do this with good um, magnification to make sure that you are doing it correctly. And once you've managed that, you would um, then fill the canal with a flowable um, GP. Or if the, the um, root is very thin and very weak, you would opt to rather fill the whole root canal with MTA, cover that with resin modified gloss honomer, and then restore the tooth. And then um, there is the popotomy procedure on an immature permanent tooth. Now, um, lately, or new um, um, research shows that a popotomy can also be done on a tooth that is not only asymptomatic, but also symptomatic with irreversible pulpitis. And that is something that wasn't done in the past. Um, this would then not only be applicable to a tooth that is um, still immature, but it can also be done on a young adult's um, permanent molar. Now, this sounds very funny, but the principle is based on the fact that um, bone resorption occurs as early as 15 days um, after the pulpal infection. And the lesion in the pulp stabilizes, but the periapical inflammation precedes the total pulp necrosis. Thus, the um, idea is to remove the inflamed pulp, and then um, that can then enable repair of the periapical lesion. So your procedural steps would be very much the same as for the primary tooth, where you would completely remove the coronal pulp. You would use sodium hypochloride and MTA to cover those pulpal stumps and then restore the tooth as always. Please note that there are not many long-term robust studies done on this treatment yet. So it's still in the experimental phase, but it is good to know that um, there is movement in this direction. So in pediatric dentistry, you know, there's never a dull moment. On top of managing the burial of that child, we also have to manage the parents and we have to take very important decisions in between. And those decisions that we take and the treatment that we choose will have lifelong consequences. So in short, don't be rushed when you make your diagnosis. Think about what you are doing. Ensure that you are um, applying evidence-based dentistry and enjoy. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity.
Thank you, Nadine, Dr. Mulek. That was absolutely informative. Um, you've covered such a broad topic in such a wonderful way. Um, I really must compliment you. I'd now like to open up the floor to questions and answers. So if everyone can just post your questions on the Q&A section, that would be wonderful. Let's see what we've got so far. Um, so there is an anonymous attendee who'd like to know what would the effect of SDFB on the pulp if we decide to use it on uh, IPC, especially if two millimeters of dentine is in place. I don't know if you can see that, uh, Dr. Muller. Yes, I can see it now. Thank you. Yes, um, I know that SDF uh, penetrates the tooth um, to a, 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 a large extent. And um, if it's very close to the pulp, um, I would not recommend you place it um, on the tooth because that might cause um, bubble irritation. So on a, on a large, large carious lesion, which is very close to the pulp, I would not use SDF. Thank you. Um, and then there's another. Uh, it seems that some practitioners prefer to fill the canals up to the apex, especially if filled with, for example, metapex. Is that okay? Yes. Um, the, the good thing about metapex is that it is resorbable. Um, and I have seen um, x ray photos that we have taken after filling with metapex and vitapex, where we've overfilled the canals. And after a two week follow up, um, all of that residual tissue is cleared up. So um, it is okay because it is resorbable. Oh, and it also okay. disinfects that area. Yes, yes. Um, and then how important is rubber dam um, really for primary pulp therapy? Rubber dam, unfortunately, is very important. Um, any form of um, contamination will negatively affect the outcome of your treatment. So um, it is something that we'll have to get our minds, minds around. If you cannot use the rubber dam, try to opt for something like Octrogate, and make sure that you isolate that tooth properly and that you have a very good assistant that will ensure that you don't have moisture contamination in that pulp. Definitely, I agree. It's definitely a skill we all have to get um, good at. <laughs> um, the other question is, in your opinion, what is the ideal combination of medicaments or materials for pulpotomy? Yes, that is, I, I would almost say that's personal preference, but if I had to go back to the literature, um, what the AAPD and the IAPD recommend is the use of former Cressel and MTA. So that would be the ideal combination. Um, but um, we don't all have access to that. So um, I have also seen very good results with ferric sulfate and zinc oxide eugenol in combination. But the ideal combination, I would say, is for a form of crystal with MTA. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a question here about codes from for the medical aids doing a pulpectomy on a primary tooth. Is that something that you can answer or can they just get that yes. from us? Um, I'll try to remember it off by heart, but it's something like 8131 and 8132 um, for, for um, the um, pulpectomies. So the first canal obturation and the second canal obturation, but I'll have to, I'll have to double check on that. But there is a specific code for pulpectomy and primary teeth. Okay. Um, and then... Cooperation of kids on some of this long procedures, what would be your uh, advice? Yeah. Um, That's a whole topic on its own. <laughs> it's a whole topic on its own, um, but um, it, it is indeed a whole topic, a topic on its own. But um, if you are familiar with the procedures, it becomes easier and easier. And um, doing a pulpotomy is almost like just adding an extra step to a normal restoration. Um, it's quite difficult to do these procedures um, if you are in the chair, um, but um, if you have access to nitrous oxide sedation, that would help, um, or maybe um, doing it under um, some form of sedation would also help to do these long procedures. For sure, for sure. 
Um, and then let's see another one. What criteria do we use when deciding to do a pulpotomy on a mature permanent tooth of a young patient? I think you covered some of that, but perhaps you want to just shed some light again. Um, you know, as I said, that's only in the experimental phase, so I can't really give you um, an academic answer there that is right or wrong. Um, but from what um, I have gathered is you can even, um, I, if you have reversible pulpitis, you can do that. And even in some cases of irreversible pulpitis, you can do that. The um, only drawback is that if you choose, if you use MTA, which you should use, is if you have to go back into those canals, you will most probably not be able to do that. And then you will end up um, in an extraction. So if you think a tooth has swelling and a severe infection, it would be much better to rather do a proper root canal treatment from the beginning. But I think if there's just um, a reversible pulpitis, I think you could still opt to do that. For sure. Thank you. Um, and then what type of material is Theracal? Theracal is calcium hydroxide, which is reinforced with resin. So um, I don't want to um, badmouth anything, but I have not seen very good results in pulpotomies when Theracal was used. It's calcium hydroxide combined with the resin. Okay. Um, with, oh no, we lost it. Let's go back. With deep interproximal caries on primary molars and complete moisture control is not possible, can amalgam still be used <laughs> as a final yes, resource? Yes, there is still a place for amalgam, although internationally they are shying away from an amalgam, not specifically because of the toxicity to the patient, but more um, environmentally speaking. But if you have access to amalgam, um, I think there is still a place for that. Um, a lot of people are, it's a controversial topic though, um, but if you have nothing else um, available, you can still use that. Okay. And I see Dr. Mariki Weekly has just told us that um, the popectomy on the anterior tooth code is A312 and on the posterior is A313. So I think that's correct. Right. Yeah, I had the wrong way around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Another attendee also asked for a code for the LSTR, if you know. I am not sure what code we would use for that. I'll also have to check on that. Um, yeah, we can also maybe find it from the SAAPD um, later on. We can post it. Um, we'll talk about that later. Let's see. There's a few more. Um, clinically, how should one decide between IPC and pulpotomy in a borderline case with caries so close to the pulp you might ex expose during removal? Um, sorry, could you just repeat that question? I can't see it clinically. I'm just going to get back to it. My screen just moved. Go right. Clinically, how should one decide between IPC and pulpotomy in a borderline case with caries so close to the pulp you might expose during removal? If um, it's always difficult to tell um, whether you have enough dentin covering the pulp. Um, so ideally you should have more than two millimeters of dentin covering the pulp. But if you think you are very close to that pulp, if it's a borderline and you are in doubt, rather do a pulpotomy because um, then you know uh, the tooth won't blow up. Um, so if in doubt, rather do the pulpotomy. For sure. Um, and then the Vitapex tips, some practitioners find it a bit thick to reach yes. the full length of the tooth. So can you maybe lend us some tips on how to overcome that? Yeah, sometimes if you struggle with that, you can prepare the tooth um, to, more, to like a, a size 35. And um, usually if you use a size 35 file, then the Vitapex tip should fit in. If you still struggle, 
you can go up into the length where you can get it in and then start to um, to deposit the material. And with the compression, the, the um, coronal compression, you should be able to get that in there. You can also use a um, K file, a clean K file, wh which you may um, then put into the canal and try to condense it a little more. Okay, thank you. Um, how do you treat an anterior permanent tooth fractured due to trauma just above bone level with the crown still attached? How do you treat an anterior permanent tooth? Fractured due to trauma. That was Dr. Drea, Nune Drea, who asked, how do you treat an anterior permanent tooth fractured due to trauma just above bone level with the crown still attached? So if it's fractured, the crown is still attached hmm. um, and it's an immature permanent tooth, I assume, then you would treat it as um, I explained for the um, uh, apexogenesis. It's a vital tooth. Um, trauma just happened. You would then remove that first, uh, depending on how long it took the patient to get to your practice. If uh, the patient came straight away, you would just remove about two millimeters of that pulp to um, put MTA on there, and then the crown can then, you know, so the crown is still um, still attached. So if the crown is still attached up to the, then it should be easy then to restore the crown. I don't know if I understand the question correctly. I think that's about it. Um... Yeah, uh, Dr. Shishonge, I think I got the name right, says thank you very much. Uh, can you also share some tips on how to take good periapicals with yeah, good that diagnostic is, that value? Is <laughs> that is very difficult. Um, so the ideal would be to use a RIN apparatus because that, that um, guides the um, the cone and um, if you have a, a, if you don't have a um, rin apparatus there are specific um, a, a, um, handles that you can put um, the x-ray photo in the, the um, sensor in as well and then you don't have to put your hand in the patient's mouth you can use that to position the x-ray photo or the sensor and takes the x-ray photo with that and um, there are also um, available some stickers that you can put on the sensor so that um, the patient can bite on the sticker and the sensor is um, positioned next to the tooth. It is very difficult to take a very good x-ray photo in a child um, because the parents don't always know exactly how to hold that x-ray photo but there are some um, things available to make it a little bit easier. I, I find that handle works very well. Okay, thank you. Um, and then Dr. Tabo Setsiba says, cooperation of kids on some of these long procedures, <laughs> baby management again. What is your advice on this one? Yeah, that is that is um, difficult um, for the longest procedures. Um, and if a, a patient is very uncooperative, then the outcome is not going to be positive. Um, then you would most likely opt to do... Um, rather an extraction if you have a very very uncooperative child um, it wouldn't be um, in the in your favor or in the child's favor to do a long procedure where you know the outcome is not going to be positive because if there's contamination and if you can't do the proper job then rather get rid of the problem if there's a severe infection if um, the tooth is if it's only an, a large carious lesion you can still go um, the carious arrest route try to then apply SDF if you're not too close to the pulp and then cover the rest of the, of the tooth with glass ionomer. Hmm. So in that case, would you say you'd have to maybe uh, do over more visits, maybe call the child back, do that, and then call the child back and carry on like that? Yes, so um, I think, um, as I said right in the very beginning, um, going the... Um, the more conservative route carries a rest rather than, um, uh, than invasive treatment. Um, so if a tooth is not 
irreversibly inflamed. You can still try, or, or if there's no reversible pulpitis, but just large carious lesions, you can still try to apply STF. Um, if they allow you, you can place glass on them. If not, just with the STF, you can do follow-up um, treatments for that or follow-up appointments for that child to monitor. For sure. Um, and then another question from an uh, anonymous attendee. Um, do you do pulpotomy and a permanent filling in one appointment, uh, bearing in mind the setting time of biodentine and MTA? Yeah, that is a problem. So the biodentine, um, it's difficult to work with, but you can do the whole restoration with biodentine. So you can fill the whole tooth up you have to wait about 12 to 20 minutes for that to sit completely, but that is possible to do that in one um, visit. And the MTA, ideally one should do it in two visits, um, but if it's not possible, um, you can cover the MTA with a resin modified gloss onoma and then restore the tooth, but ideally to allow it to sit in two visits. Awesome. That seems to be the last of our questions, Nadine. But if there are any further questions, I'd like to encourage the participants to post it on the SAAPD website or on the web WhatsApp group, rather. Um, for those of you who don't, are not aware, we do have several WhatsApp groups uh, where we even post case studies with um, two members of the SAAPD and um, there's lots of chats happening around those cases and so on. So I do encourage those members who are not yet SADA members, who are not yet members of SAAPD and even the non-SADA members, if you'd like to join, please um, follow us on our Facebook page, on our Instagram handle. The Instagram handle will read as Pediatric Dentistry ZA. Um, and come join us um, in SAAPD. Thank you so much, Dr. Mulich. Dr. Mulich is also part of our SAAPD um, group and we value her contribution so much. You can see from tonight's presentation, it's absolutely amazing. Um, so thank you, Dr. Mulich. And um, mm -hmm. for those of you who are also wanting to know about your CPD, there is one clinical CPD for this, but please can you complete your evaluation at the end of the webinar so that we can actually get those CPDs. <laughs> Dr. Mulek, thank you once again for your thank awesome, you. awesome presentation. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you. I think we can now close the webinar. Thanks.